empirical womanism includes their own experiences and consciousness and would and includes other oppressed and marginalized groups their writings showcase how women are placed in different locations in our social hierarchy social context and institutional structures around them play a huge role in determining their rights uh, <clears throat> explore the dalit uh, select poems by few dalit poets like kalyani thakur anita singh maya singh jyoti lanjivara i have taken only one poem or only few lines from one poems of these in order to prove uh, that uh, dalit feminism is a different uh, as uh, is a different category and it cannot be i mean it just should not be included in the indian feminism uh, it can be part of it but it has to have its separate and specific identity the paper highlights the point that these poets hailing from different cultural and social backgrounds have no doubt suffered the triple operation petrarchy caste and class but uh, they have also uh, tried to break these shackles with significant success the poets have successfully explored the intricate interconnect between caste gender and class that exists in indian social structure and they even try to bring some changes in indian uh, social structure that's the main point the women uh, are what cynthia stepon calls thrice removed and alienated and they are uh, poetry uh, cynthia, cynthia stephen also supporting this woman says that dalit womanism is broader in scope and it will not only build and shape its theory it will also learn to mediate the space and build solidarity between itself and the exist, existing feminist movement thought and theory okay this uh, triple uh, of works in public space takes a parallel shape in private space too and the these lies uh, sufficiently prove that how the women are taken as commodities and they don't have any choice even at when it comes to the sexual matters it is important to note that violence is used here as a means of social control by the dominant groups the location of violence is important then the women are vulnerable both in private and public space out of their home for work the sole purposes and uh, when they are oppressed when they are exploited sex sexually dalit men these dalit women by writing their lived experiences have tried to define themselves as uh, capable of resisting atro atrocities either caste class or gender based both in private and public sphere which so far has not been uh, through their writings they are placing themselves at the center and as Uh, subjects and trying to come out from the uh, periphery to the center the, their poetry like the poetry of the lithman has a agenda that is to fight this operation petrarchal as well as class based uh, now uh, here hira uh, bansode in one of his women she writes where sita entered the fire to prove her fidelity where ahilya was turned to stone because because of indra's lust where draupadi was fractured to serve five her friends in that country a woman is still a slave in a poem called petition she uh, gives expression to the deplorable plight of the dalit women and uh, she describes the churning of dalit women in the uh, the tribal nexus of this caste class and gender and she says a refugee in my home called faryad she highlights the gap between the dalit women and the upper caste women and she says i visualize a funny picture a white collar woman is running behind a western lady and 2000s mile behind the white collar woman is a tiny point on the horizon a dalit woman traveling traveling in their direction this is an uneven race here she is pointing out the the white gap between trying to make up for that in a poem called yashodhara she uh, voices the collective consciousness of dalit women who exist on the extreme fringe of indian society and she uh, uh, she describes yashodhara as a dream of sharp pain lifelong sorrow whose silent songs make the promise of heavenly happiness hollow the poet having clung to my hunger my sari hand 
ant hangs on my belly like JJ Masama at the embankment. When I become a stream of sweat working for wages, my sari and would blot the sweat on my face as a breeze. When wearied having worked in the fields and crops, the sari and offers me relief as a cloth for mapping on the floor. When my late husband fumes and frats on me, I readily find it handy in the fist like a lump of butter to wipe off my tears. The sarian, the rag that's first casualty in the hands of men within the men outside home to drag me for molestation. Uh, I have taken one poet, one poet, Anita Bharti, who writes in Hindi and uh, she's a Dalit activist uh, who lives in Delhi and he, she, uh, she uh, critiques the uh, bl and rather blame us like dumb bets, hawk our lives. We know what's going wrong, but what can we do? Our ancestors did the same thing we are doing today. Our children will inherit that. Uh, even some non-Dalit women poets like Maya Sin, who write in Hindi, they have also championed the cause of Dalit women. And uh, she's trying to find, she's trying to highlight the point that basically a woman is a subaltern and be it a Dalit woman or upper caste woman, they face the same kind of uh, sufferings. She says, she writes, Teri meri kaya, uh, Zulm aur sitam oghere mein tu meri ek saheli hai, teri jaisi kaya meri tera jaisa man. That she says that you are, you are like me and, and in this uh, game of uh, operation, she shares her dream of uh, a society, egalitarian Indian society, where there is no difference between rich and poor and untouchable and uh, upper caste. And she says that this kind of society is possible only through education. She says, dharti pe shiksha कि धूप पहले इतनी पहले इतनी दूर तलक दलित की कुटिया रोशन हो राज महल भी हम सर हो that is the edge the light of education should go can go that far that it can enlighten both the uh, the house of a king as well as the dalits then you know among the the writers we have also chaya uh, korgaonkar i think she is present here i met her yesterday and she was going to tell me that she will be reciting some girl called Mirbai. And, uh, and in this poem, she speaks about the in inhumanity of uh, society towards women in general. Candles were burnt after your death. Was not it possible that they were burnt earlier? Candles of humanity? Then perhaps you would not have been raped. The image of mother as symbol of supreme sacrifice also keeps occurring in Dalit women's poetry, as we see in Jyoti Langevo's poem, where the mother is not only a symbol of sacrifice, but also socially awakened woman. The so these uh, women poet having, uh, they, they are, uh, uh, I, it is the woman, Dalit woman, who is being celebrated in these in their poetry. Uh, either she is being celebrated or she is being sympathized. She has come to the center and uh, no longer uh, at the periphery. She is the main subject from the object position. These poets have tried to bring the woman to the subject position. They negotiate different subject position mapped out for them. Through their writings, they strive to redraw the, uh, the reformer lift, the feminist dialogue to accommodate majority of women into it. Thus, they fight the homogenization, stress the diversity of women's experiences, and thereby they defy the certainties. Thank you, Rashmi, for your paper. Uh, but before, before I request uh, Mini Mungia to uh, make a presentation, let me introduce Chandra Shekhar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have not introduced you earlier, so I'm introducing you before she starts. After that, you. And who is, who is going to make a presentation on caste and gender portrayal of Dalit persona in Telugu cinema? So, uh, one minute more. Well, hello everyone. Um, and so, my presentation is. Um, a little different for a couple of reasons. One, because it's not a, a formal paper, but the uh, that I'm going to talk about has sold apparently 2.5 million copies. 
And these are numbers that are completely incomprehensible if you think of the kind of print runs that um, the writers that we normally associate with um, with the stuff that we study, which would broadly go under the umbrella of Indian writing in, in English or, or literary writing in any case, even if you brought in the uh, English domain. So the numbers here are very, very different, right? The print runs there are more in the 300 range, whereas here it's more. His first book, apparently, the first book was uh, published uh, with 5,000 copies, and it went on to sell out within a week. Yeah? Um, so for those reasons, it seems to me uh, important and interesting to address uh, the work that he does. Um, I should add, by the way, that Amish the party only goes now by the name Amish. Okay, so he's a brand name without a last name. Um, so what the question I want to ask is that what are the implications of Amisha's creation of, of Sati, Shiva's wife? So the, the trilogy sort of takes on the story of Shiva, he says, before Shiva was a god, okay? And it's set in like 1900 uh, BC and some husband dies um, a year after this event. And so both of these then uh, grant upon her uh, the status of being an untouchable, yeah? So, I mean, to me, what is, what is interesting about this is uh, that it is a reflection of... Uh, it is a reflection of, of caste in contemporary India as well as a reworking of it, yeah? So one of the things that, you know, I find that we should sort of try and ferret through is uh, how do we go about reading the fact that anybody can become an outcast, right? So you know, so you are not you are not born into it, but you can become it. Um, so in a lot of ways, you have a similar sort of person that one is not, uh, you know, one can't take terribly seriously for a whole host of reasons. But we, who you have to for popularity reasons um, is is that they are writing for essentially an Indian readership, right? So they're writing for an Indian readership. Um, and for a, a group of readers who are not particularly interested in the literary. So by this I mean not only, let's say, the sorts of concerns that have um, characterized Anglophone literature of the last 30 years, uh, but, but whose writing approach is um, determinedly anti-literary. So both Amish and, and Bhagat have taken great pride in pointing out that they're essentially going to be the fodder, right? So they're going to be the ones who are going to be killed in before um, then the more trained soldiers can, can enter. So it's a sort of a, a strategic military decision that's made, but it's also, uh, it seems to me, a decision that allows us to read into how the vikarma in a way have to sort of pay their price to get reinstituted into uh, the, the new you know administrative and social world that is being constructed by um, Shiva and so that's that's indeed what happens we have our vikarma battle go into battalion go into the battle and and um, a substantial number of them is is killed um, but meanwhile, what they've managed to attain as a result of it is a kind of a place um, with the rest of the other groups that make up this um, society and, which, and in which they had no place up to this, um, up to this time. Um, Sati too is a devoted Meluhun and very, very committed actually to being a Vikarma. So there is never any questioning of her fate on her part. Um, and amongst the curses, by the way, that she has as a result of being this outcast is that she can have absolutely no physical contact at all with anybody. And so, you know, so completely the stuff that uh, we are all here in this room familiar with, I mean, she's an untouchable, and if she is touched, then the person who touches her has to undergo two days of cleansing rituals and pujas and etc., etc., yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, and so she, of all people, uh, shows absolutely no resentment towards this, but in fact, uh, acceptance that this is her lot. And so, as a good uh, member of a society that has uh, devised ways of, of being a society, she's accepting of this without any uh, 
rebelliousness. So when Shiva suggests that <coughs> he would like to marry her and etc., she is completely opposed to this idea because she's, this is not something in the realm of her um, possibility. And then in this battle, she is shot with a poison arrow and she is on death's bed and, and is supposed to die, but then there's a miracle and she doesn't. And so when that happens, uh, she is then able to accept that some alteration to the whole social structure can take place. And so when Shiva then punishes the Vikarmanos, she is able to accept it because she has quite literally been reborn. I mean, she has virtually died and then come back into um, uh, literally a new, a new life. Um, so that in itself too is, I think, an interesting uh, feature to think about, you know, this rebirth um, that Sati sort of goes through in order to become, um, in order to become then the person who, well, we already see her actually as being that amazing female warrior princess woman, but um, she then takes on her role as an equal partner to Shiva, yeah? Um, so that, let me just try and wrap this up. Um, I think, you know, I, it seems to me like at a conference like this, it would be interesting to think about um, not only the works that we're looking at, but actually the ways in which they circulate in the world. And so um, the fact that I'm looking at these popular fictions, very different from anything that um, most of us spend our time on, tell us something, I think, about reading communities and about readership and, and uh, you know, at least it's one way of tapping into the pulse of what is uh, significant and important, perhaps in contemporary India. And it may not, it may not be something that um, you know one can, because the novels are so poorly written. It's it's difficult to talk about the material in the novels without a certain amount of self-consciousness. Okay. So I feel kind of like, you know, what am I doing talking about the Mish Tripathi? I mean, they're really badly written novels, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. But having said that, they are still novels that are of significance because they're being read. And I imagine that they're being read because they offer us models of how to imagine ourselves. And so to me, like, you know, I've just started working on this popular fiction, and I've done some work on Shobha Dei, Chetan Bhagat, and now Mish Tripathi, you know, going down there, you know, <laughs> slipping down there. Uh, but you know, so one of the one of the the things that he takes on is a pre-partition reality, for instance. You know, so to me it seems interesting that in 2015 or whatever 2010, since he's been writing, why is he now imagining an India that is set in a mythic past, but in which partition was imagined differently, different communities and their relationship to each other is imagined differently, and caste and gender relations are imagined differently. Yeah. So that seems important for me to address. Uh, at the same time, I don't want to leave you all thinking that I think of Tripathi uh, or Amish as a reformist writer only because he is both that and also not. And I think it's important to kind of keep in mind that even as he's offering us alternate ways of imagining caste and gender relations, he's also subscribing in a lot of ways to other aspects of what it means to be a good Hindu in India today. Thank you. Building and enduring aspect of India's everyday life. Cinema is a powerful media that represents and influences any culture. Like in many major fields, Dalits of the society do not have notions of defy Dalit caste through indirect, uh, without mentioning the caste identity of the characters, but Certain legitimized signs and norms such as name, habits, occupation, body, behavior, and occupied spaces. This paper is an attempt to analyze the position allotted to Dalit men and women in the narrative of Telugu cinema. The movie which I have taken for analysis is Jayam Manadera, which means Victory is ours, which came in 2000, is taken for my analysis. The, the, the film was a blockbuster and a, a Hero got Filmfare Award for Best Actor and later draw attention for its realistic approach, as critics said. The movie was made in 2000, at a time when the Dalit movement has developed strongly in Andhra Pradesh against the backdrop of increased atrocities, atrocities against Dalits in Karam Chedu, Chunduru, and Vempenta. These atrocities led to the establishment of uh, Dalit Mahasabha, paving the way for the collective struggle of Dalits for self-respect. 
The movie, uh, present movie is set behind two historical backdrops in Andhra Pradesh. One is role of caste politics, I think. Okay, uh, I have two, two or three objections with the first presenter. Uh, like some of the, uh, the things that you quoted. Like uh, when we talk about uh, general women's experience, there is a, uh, there is a problem. And again, uh, education as a means through which we can uh, liberate ourselves from the pledges or whatever casteism. Uh, because we need to also take into consideration the fact that we also had upper caste women coming out to the streets and protesting against the Mandal Commission uh, recommendations. So education is not something that we can actually uh, take as, say, for granted to remove casteism. That's one thing. And again, uh, the pain and pathos kind of a model is also something that actually puts off certain people from studying literature, Dalit literature, especially because it's just about pain and pathos. So again, when we essentialize Dalit literature largely into this fold, uh, that actually brings this question of the flowery language, whether the Dalit writer is actually not uh, capable of producing the flowery language. So this question of the literariness of Dalit literature is something that is being discussed in the classrooms. So that's also something that I would want uh, you to comment on. And uh, this next question, last question is to the second presenter. Uh, I mean, it's not a question. Actually, I would say that can't we also think about Indian writing in English as also an elite space where we can actually, uh, you know, use these packaging for mythologies? So the position of the writer, for instance, there are several other writers. You know, someone got it from Marathi. There are also writers like Yogesh Master in Kannada, who again use mythology, uh, reuse mythology, and talk other things which are not acceptable for the larger. In the public, so maybe we should also consider such things. Thank you. Okay. Let me answer first about the flowery language. Now, I, mean, I didn't say that they are not capable of using that. I said that because their experiences have been very horrible, so how can they use that kind of a language? So, uh, if their experiences of life are good enough, maybe they can they can have the luxury. Just, just one thing, because um, th there is also a problem of musimization here, because you assume, or we assume the Dalits to be always in pain. This actually doesn't allow us to also talk about Dalit men and women, say, in higher education, in academic spaces, in universities, where they sit next to you, sit with you, and teach you. So it can't always be the pain and pathos in one sense. So that's why I'm saying the diversity of experience is also something that we cannot count for. Also, they are among the other women poets. Also, they have. I mentioned that they have also celebrated. They have written about uh, their uh, uh, womanhood and how they celebrated. Now, new writers are also coming. They are giving new direction. And as for education as a means to uh, you know come out of it, what else do we have? I mean, we can't just impose that. Okay, stop caste system. Uh, we can make the best of what we have. And education is considered to be one of the means of uh, you know getting rid of all these things. So, I'm not saying that that can eradicate caste system forever and not be in the society absolutely. But that is one of the, I mean, they can, that can show us a hope, I know, that even educated people practice that. I'm not saying that. But then education is something, I mean, there is, let us have some hope that through education maybe, you know, things can improve. Thank you all for uh, a session as lively as the early ones. Uh, we'll break for tea, we'll break for tea, yes, but only for 10 minutes.